What's up guys, Cirrus here. Today we're going to have a video response to a channel called Inspired Walk who have 10 questions atheists can't answer. Let's get right into it. Do you really believe that science is the only answer to all of life's questions? No, not really. It generally can explain a lot of things in the world, but science can't explain whether or not I'm going to have a bowl of ice cream today, and then hemorrhage my insides out because I'm lactose intolerant. Actually, wait, no, science does explain that. Never mind. If God doesn't exist, why do you care if people worship him? This is actually a good one. See, I don't particularly care what brand of imaginary friend you worship. I care when part of that worship involves indoctrinating others. My issue isn't necessarily a god, but religion on the whole. Religion wouldn't bother me if it wasn't a leading factor in demonstrable ignorance, sheep-like thinking, homophobia, halting of scientific progress, ostracism of family members, the list goes on. For instance, if a Jehovah's Witness has a god, that doesn't bother me. But when they shun their family because the church says to do it, eh, then the religion is causing obvious harm. By and large, many religions do this on some level or another, and hence I have a problem with religion. Not necessarily that you worship God. Next. Seriously, can nothing create something? Define create? No, seriously, no one has ever witnessed anything created. In the history of ever. And no models of the Big Bang Theory suggest that nothing created anything. Background microwave radiation shows that our universe came from a fairly humble origins. On that note, did you know that an atom is mostly comprised of empty space? Now imagine every atom in existence in a tiny little space, much like compressed air. Now imagine all the space in the atoms are removed so that only solid matter exists. Now the atoms can be condensed incredibly tightly and packed into one another. Again, a lot like compressed air. Now, imagine that that can of compressed air is pierced. All of those atoms rapidly expand outward. That's sort of like what we imagine the Big Bang to have been like. Those tightly condensed atoms expand outward, roughly shaping stars in the universe because they're made up of lighter elements. Then those stars die out, causing light flammable elements to start to build newer, heavier elements expanding outward to form other planets. Uh, my analogy here might not be exactly correct, but think of a volcano erupting in the ocean. As the lava cools, some of it pops to form landmass, like what we see from Hawaii. That's kind of like the stars do. They die out and destroy their surroundings, all the little pieces come together in the planets. Again and again, as they gain enough mass, you have a strong gravitational field, and then... Uh, oh, shit. I'm not explaining this very well at all. Fuck it, next. If you've never been to the ends of the earth, can I just say I love the music in your background? It's distracting as hell, but damn, it's nice. If you've never been to every planet, if you've never been to every part of the universe, how do you know that God doesn't exist? I don't know that he doesn't exist, and I don't assert that he doesn't exist. But I'm not the one making a claim. That would be you. And you haven't been to the ends of the earth either, so you can't exactly say he does exist. What is the origin of life? That would be abiogenesis at work. You see, the matter in your body is no different than the matter in the ground or in the water. It's all made up of the same basic stuff, it's just heavy elements from collapsed stars. Abiogenesis gives us a model that shows how inorganic matter can be assembled to make simple, single-cell organic life. After abiogenesis starts the cogs of life turning, evolution kicks in to diversify that organic life, eventually leading us to the many species of life we see today. In fact, the Miller and Urey experiment showed that in early Earth conditions, just some lightning could facilitate the production of amino acids required for RNA and DNA to take shape. You know, the building blocks of life. If humans are animals, then where does our sense of justice, where does our sense of morality, where does our sense of what's right and what's wrong come from? Ooh, ooh, the moral argument. I love this one. Okay, so you see, animals in the world exhibit something called altruism. It's sort of like a moral code for the animal kingdom. And people are animals too. We've witnessed dogs running through traffic to help another wounded dog escape the road, and animals helping their less fortunate get fed and survive in pack species like wolves or lions. Animals exhibit altruism, even when they have no, quote, moral code, as we would define it. So even animals can help one another. I don't see why humans would be any different. Society plays a part in dictating what morals you'll find in your daily life, and while we see many of the morals that are sort of universal, like murdering and theft being wrong, 
Generally speaking, you'll see morals differ from culture to culture, making them, for the most part, completely relative and definitely not objective at all. If you were given irrefutable evidence that the God of the Bible is real, would you become a Christian? Hard to say, because in some sects, a Christian is just somebody who believes that God exists and died for their sins. But there are other sects that believe entirely differently than that. So I guess believing the God of the Bible doesn't necessarily automatically make me a Christian. On that note, the God of the Bible is also the God of the Quran and the Torah. So would that make me a Jew or a Muslim? It's hard to say. I think the real question you're trying to ask is if I saw God or I had evidence of God, would I no longer be an atheist? And at that point, of course, I couldn't be an atheist. I would see God and he would exist. Whether or not I worship that God, that's an entirely different question. But that's not what you're asking. Tell me something. If evolution is real, and if evolution is really happening, how come there are no transitional forms that we can observe? Who lied to you? Uh, no, no, seriously, who did it? We have plenty of transitional fossils. Because evolution's constantly happening. Any new fossil we find is just another missing link on the chain of evolution for whatever species that fossil belongs to. I, okay, okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that you're asking about something like a dinosaur turning into a bird. Ignoring the fact that birds are dinosaurs. No, seriously, look it up. An accurate velociraptor is basically just a really scary chicken. The fossil record does not show one species halfway through transforming into another. What we see is a gradual changing of species over time, sometimes branching off into different types of that same species. I like having many types of cats today. Any fossil in the record is a transitional fossil. Do you live according to what you believe, or do you live your life according to what you lack in belief? Personally, I'm a secular humanist. Atheism can't give your life a moral code on its own. So I don't just live my life according to my lack of belief in a god, but by my belief that human beings are generally reasonable, worth keeping around, and that the progress and sustainability of the human race is incredibly important. Because, you know, I'm a human. If God doesn't exist, and the Christian dies, the Christian loses nothing. But if God does exist, and you die as an atheist, do you not lose more? Will you not lose your soul? Define a soul, please. No evidence has ever shown that a soul even exists. Regardless, what you're using is something called Pascal's Wager. The shorthand of it is that if I can believe a god and I die, I go to heaven, and if I don't, I go to hell. If he doesn't exist and I believe, nothing happens either way. But the winning bet is on believing God, simply because there's no harm in believing if he doesn't exist, and a ton of benefit if he does. The problem with that wager is what if your God doesn't exist, but some other one does? Who is he going to be more angry at? The person who says he didn't have enough evidence, or the person who asserts that their God exists? When this hypothetical real God knows that you're just bullshitting yourself, I'd make a wager that if he exists, and he's not the god of the Bible, he'd value rational thought and a wrong but honest conclusion over a false assertion. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. No, by definition, faith can't help you see anything. Faith is belief without evidence, so you'd automatically not be able to see anything on faith alone. But after this point, he just preaches a little bit about his side of things and tries to woo atheists who couldn't answer his questions to believe in the God of the Bible. If that's something you want to watch, I'll have the entire video linked in the description. Anyways, guys, thanks a ton for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more content. And if you'd like to support this channel, there will also be a Patreon link in the description below. Thanks for coming by.